Good evening, everyone. <laughs> Welcome to the South African Institute of Electrical Engineers panel discussion on 5G and radio frequency transmission. We're debunking the health myth. I hope everybody is safe wherever they are. Tonight, we'll be hearing from four expert speakers from academia, regulatory, network solution providers, and the health sector. Each speaker will have time to present about 10 minutes. Without further ado, we will start with our first speaker. Um, there are places where they squeeze human brains. It is said that if you apply enough pressure in squeezing a cold, you get a diamond. If you squeeze a man hard enough, you get the best out of his mind. Of course, provided it doesn't pop out. Uh, one man from such institution is Professor Alan Clark from the University of the Witwatersrand. He'll be giving us a crash course in electromagnetism. Don't worry, for all of you guys, there is no exam uh, for this course. So you can relax. Prof, uh, we can start with the presentation. Okay, good evening all. I have been asked to look at uh, what the electromagnetic spectrum looks like, and in particular, why telecoms uses parts of it. So without further ado then, um, we'll look at the electromagnetic spectrum. And uh, this sort of goes from DC to light and beyond. Um, the important thing to realize is that there is, in fact, only one. So when our counterparts in uh, the fiber type of arena comes along and when they run out of bandwidth, all we do is we pull another fiber. So we start with the old fashioned and very expensive SAT3. And of course, when we run out of bandwidth, we simply pull some more fibers. This becomes a little bit more difficult when you are dealing with the electromagnetic spectrum. You cannot pull another one. Dear God doesn't tend to work too well. So how do we deal with this? Well, history tells us how we, we manage to, to deal with the uh, electromagnetic spectrum, uh, what part of it is used and how it is used, and this is true going forward likewise. So the important thing here is that everything scales with frequency, and perhaps I need to re-emphasize that everything scales with frequency, and that means wavelength. The 300 over frequency in megahertz gives us the size. Everything scales in terms of that size. The ideal half-wave dipole is 150 meters at 1 megahertz. You're not going to put that in your back pocket, and that's why we don't use 150 meters worth of antennas. Um, if we're dealing with TV 1, 2, and 3, we're at 200 megs, and that's about 3 quarters of a meter. At DSM, we're dealing down to 160 odd millimeters. Then at 2.45 gigahertz, Wi Fi to the rescue is 61 millimeters. Remember, that is also what you use to cook your potato in your microwave oven. Perhaps we will return to that a little bit later. But the Wi Fi at 5 gig, which isn't, it's at 6 gigs, is 26 millimeters. So if you take an ordinary good old fashioned wall um, at one megahertz, that wall is absolutely insignificant as compared to 150 meters. At six gigahertz, however, that is several wavelengths wide. And that's why at six gigs, you don't get through walls or at least not very easily. Why does telecoms use the radio frequency spectrum in the particular way that it does? Well, we all want faster. And what that means is that we need a thick pipe. And if we want faster, we need a thicker pipe. And that gives us better water flow. So what this translates to is that if we want a pipe of a certain size, let's say 100 megahertz wide, 
you can't put the thing at a center frequency of 200 megahertz. It doesn't fit. So what this ultimately means is that we need to go higher and higher in frequency. At GSM frequencies, the biggest pipe that we can accommodate is 20 megahertz. It comes in various different sizes, but 20 megs is the biggest pipe that we can deal with. And that is about two odd percent worth of, of the center frequency. At 5G, so three and a half gigahertz, a hundred megahertz pipe, five times the size of the pipe is again around 2%. So 2%, 3% is what we can deal with in terms of the center frequency. So that becomes comfortable. However, what happens as we go higher and higher in frequency is that the distance that we can go uh, starts plummeting. So we've all been through the 2.45 Wi-Fi versus the five Wi-Fi, and we all know that the one goes a lot further than the other. In addition to that, we have three non-overlapping channels at 2.45, and we've got 23 non-overlapping channels at the 5.8 gig. And that just means that we've got a lot more bandwidth. So the five gig gives us the bandwidth, but not the distance. Latency, and I'm lying through my teeth, but uh, close enough, is largely a matter of congestion. So if we have at 5.8 gigs plenty of spare room, the latency tends to go down, which means things get faster, which is what we want. Size, once again, everything depends upon the wavelength. And that includes walls, buildings, and people, and other such silly things. And of course, there is this lovely little thing called a sweet spot, because we want bandwidth, but we want to be able to go a reasonable distance. And perhaps the least said about that, the better. Right. Now, moving on to 5G spectrum. Um, it is important to note that nothing about 5G is actually cast in stone. So although there are some standards that are emerging, um, there's quite a lot that is still, in fact, fluid. So we have the spectrum in three different types, if you like. So at the low end, we have ordinary cell phone frequencies, six to 700 megs and you have ordinary distances as associated with that. Um, nobody's speaking about this because nobody's using it. The biggest uh, band that is used is the so-called N78, which is in the C-band. It's a subset of the C-band. And that is 3.3 to 3.8 gigahertz. So it's either called 3.5 or 3.6, depending upon who you want to listen to. This is the only band that 5G is, uh, is, is being used in, in Southern Africa. We started, of course, in Lesotho, um, uh, privately, but not, not in the public uh, setting. Rain has been using this um, since about February. And the drum roll, of course, due to COVID-19, we have Vodacom started on Monday um, in Joburg, Pretoria and Cape Town. And the comment there is that several kilometers maximum. Uh, my broadband has, in fact, been going and doing the rounds. And basically, if you can actually see the tower, then you're going to get Good connection. If you don't see the tower, well, let's keep quiet. The final band, which everybody is um, really getting their, uh, their, their themselves upset about, is the millimeter wave band. And depending upon who you speak to, so in other words, this is uh, somewhat fluid, starts at around 24 gigahertz, goes up to 39 uh, some people say it goes up to 52, and many people are going all the way up to the oxygen absorption band of 60 gigahertz. Um, this is not going to happen terribly well in South Africa, simply because we do not have 
um, that level of congestion. The N78, it must be seen, is not in fact terribly different from where we are with ordinary good old-fashioned Wi-Fi. If we look at the, the 5 gig um, Wi-Fi band, then the C band is in fact lower than that. Millimeter wave has insanely restrictive propagation, less than a kilometer, kilometer and a half, etc. Now, when it comes to 5G and uh, health, what we are trying to do is prove a negative. We're trying to say that it doesn't harm you, and that is difficult to do. If we go back 30 years, we had the 50 hertz. If we live underneath a power line, will our child get leukemia? And, well, the jury has been out on that one for a little while, but, of course, the jury is now in, and uh, the, it is clear that 50 hertz is not going to cause leukemia. GSM, we've, done, we've gone through basically the same journey. Have we done that journey with 5G? Not yet, of course. But let's look at 5G, and by 5G, we're looking at 3.6 gigahertz. We are no different from any other major frequency that we are using. Please, it is non-ionizing, so it is not the same as X-rays. And the final two issues are that 1 upon R squared is what stops us from, uh, so we go further away and we get less of an effect. If you put your phone up against your head, well, then you are close to this thing. Finally, the skin effect tells us that the current flows only in a couple of microns and mainly then causes heating. I see the numbers are increasing in terms of the attendees. Uh, for those that, that just joined, uh, that was Prof. Alan Plot. Um, yes, he's a professor. Uh, that's why you saw a lot of equations. I seemingly forgot to, to give out this bio at the start, and I felt I should do it now. Prof. was born in 1964 and came to VES as, as a first year in 1982, and has, hasn't figured out how to leave as yet. He attained a BSc in Electrical Engineering in 1987 and a PhD in 1993. Electromagnetics, antenna design, and anything to do with radio frequency has been his life passion. He has graduated two PhDs and 19 MSCs thus far. This man is still going. Uh, now it makes sense why I saw so many questions. It reminded me back when I was still in varsity. Uh, for those that are struggling with the connection, um, the session is being recorded and will also be posted later on the SAI YouTube channel. Going on to the next speaker. Did you know that uh, every wireless communication device undergoes some testing before it is used in South Africa? Well, at least the legal ones. ICASA approves all wireless devices used in South Africa, as well as the frequencies to be used. Well, the question is, will they expose us to devices that cause causes adverse health effects? Well, I guess uh, our next speaker will be telling us about that. Our next speaker is Dr. Pranel Rupal. He's an executive for engineering and technology at ICASA. He has spent 20 years working in the field of equipment authorization, spectrum monitoring, and electronic communication engineering. He holds a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering from UKZN, a master's of management in IC policy and regulation, a PhD in interdisciplinary digital knowledge economy from Vets University. Prunel is particularly passionate about applying innovative technology regulation in developing countries to help bridge the digital divide. And now the floor is yours. Thank you, Thabo. And uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Pranil Ruplal, and I'm from the Engineering and Technology Division at the Independent Communications Authority of South Africa. 
Uh, as you may know, ICASA is the sector regulator for telecommunications and broadcasting in the country. Uh, today, I'll address you on 5G and radiated frequency transmission and probably attempt to debunk some of the health myths relating to 5G. 5G is the fifth generation wireless technology for digital cellular networks. And when we compare it to 4G, for example, we find that 5G offers new network architecture that significantly boosts overall performance. 5G can, and I must add in theory, deliver a data rate of more than 10 gigabits per second with millisecond level latency and ultra high dense connections. I actually have personally witnessed 5G trials that uh, easily approach one gigabits per second download speeds right here in South Africa. Uh, and that was before Vodacom went live uh, earlier this week. And the International Telecommunications Union or the ITU is currently working on the standard for 5G mobile technologies and they call that IMT 2020. We commonly refer to this standard as 5G. 5G requires access to three basic types of frequency bands, uh, and the prof has alert, alluded to some of them as well. These are the high bands, the mid bands, and the low frequency bands. 5G employs something that uh, uh, we call uh, carrier aggregation, and this increases the data rate by using multiple frequency blocks from different frequency bands. Um, for example, frequencies between uh, uh, 2 and 8 gigahertz are known as a mid band in combination with frequencies below 2 gigahertz, which are generally referred to as the low bands, and above 8 gigahertz, which are referred to as the millimeter wave or high bands. And 5G is able to cleverly exploit the, 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 the specific characteristics of the, uh, the spectrum. The next slide that I have deals with the functions of ICASA as man mandated by the Electronic Communications Act. Uh, a specific section, section 31 of the Electronic Communications Act provides for ICASA to control, plan, administer, and manage the use and licensing of the radio frequency spectrum. And I think the key consideration here is the word efficient use of spectrum. Ensuring efficient use of spectrum is really a multi-level process. And uh, we at ICASA achieved this by allocating spectrum to different services based on ITU allocations, including migrating existing services to accommodate new services. And the ITU holds something called the World Radio Conference every four years. And ICASA attended the last one in 2019. And spectrum assignments for new technologies, just like 5G, are deliberated and finalized at these conferences. Um, as some services may already be assigned to existing users, we sometimes have to migrate existing users and even allow secondary access. And I'll discuss migration later in the next slide. Uh, but the, the final key function of ICASA with regards to Spectrum is to monitor Spectrum occupancy and to ensure that there's no illegal usage or interference. I think it's important to note here that there's no mention of ICASA regulating the health and human aspects of frequency use, as that portfolio belongs to the Department of Health. Now that we have an understanding of some of the functions of ICASA, I would like to discuss the spectrum regulatory framework that's implemented. And the overarching document in this framework is the National Radio Frequency Plan. Um, the ECASA is required in terms of section 34 of the ECA, Electronic Communications Act, to update the plan following the ITU radio communications conference. And as discussed earlier, technologies such as 5G are discussed at length by experts and from countries all around the world. And ECASA then takes the outputs from, from the WRC and develops the national radio frequency plan. And in my next slide, I've actually included a poster type picture of, of this plan, um, which you, you can have a look at. It's not extremely clear though. But, uh, and you can go onto our website and, and get uh, download this plan. We then developed the, the radio frequency regulations, which serves to establish a framework to allocate and assign radio frequency spectrum. And the national radio frequency plan 
also sets out standard terms and conditions for spectrum licenses and establishes fair and transparent and efficient procedures and processes for spectrum license applications. It also outlines the procedures and the criteria for awarding spectrum licenses for competing applications. And the next step in, in this process is the creation of the radio frequency assignment plans. The assignment plans provide information uh, on the requirements attached to the use of the frequency band in line with the allocation and other information in the National Radio Frequency Plan. This information includes technical characteristics of radio systems, frequency channeling, coordination, and details on the required migration of existing users of the band and the expected method of assignment. And the final step in this long process is migration. And this, this plan establishes the framework by which the authority may migrate users of the radio frequency spectrum in the plan. By doing that, we can provide for a significant amount of spectrum that could be released for broadband services. A good example would be the migration of analog broadcasting to make, to make way for uh, mobile broadband services. The, the next slide that I have deals with the recent spectrum assignment made by CASA in the 5G bands, and I, I guess this is the, the most topical issue. ICASA has provided temporary spectrum relief to mobile operators during this COVID-19 crisis that we are facing in South Africa. And one of the bands that we have allowed access to is the 3.5 gigahertz band. The 3.5 gigahertz band is a 5G candidate band. Uh, it's referred to as a 5G candidate band. And this is in terms of the WRC process that I'd spoken about earlier. And this band can be used to deploy 5G services. And ICASA has noted with concern that there are a number of increasing sort of fake news articles and mainly on social media platforms claiming that 5G is somehow responsible for causing or even contributing to the COVID-19 epidemic. The steps that I've described thus far, it sets out the meticulous process that we follow to assign frequencies for technologies like 5G. But I would like to further elaborate on the health and safety aspects that we contribute to with respect to 5G. ICASA carefully controls the maximum power output allowed of all telecommunications infrastructure. And we do this through standardization with international bodies, such as the ITU. And we publish something called the Official List of ICASA Regulated Standards. And this regulates the safety, EMC, and performance. EMC is electromagnetic compatibility and performance of electronic communications equipment. So all equipment that's used for telecommunications, including equipment for 5G, will have to be type approved by CASA to stringent safety, EMC, and performance standards. Now, in terms of the radiated and conducted emissions from these devices, ICASA also follows the research from, international, from, from the International Commission on Non-Ionizing Radiation Protection, or ICNIP, as they're called. ICNIP releases guidelines for the protection of humans exposed to radio frequency electromagnetic fields. And it's also valuable to know that ICNIP has found that through initial measurement studies, they, they suggest that exposure to 5G antennas will approximately be, this, be similar to that of 3G and 4G antennas. And although I've stated that ICASA doesn't regulate the health aspects of radio frequency waves, my next slide will touch briefly on the findings of the World Health Organization. There is evidence to support the claim at frequencies used by mobile phones that most of the energy absor is absorbed by the skin or other superficial tissue. And this does re result in a negligible uh, temperature rise in the brain or any other organs of the body. However, the World Health Organization has stated that to date and after much research performed, no adverse health effect has been causally linked to exposure to wireless technologies. And the World Health Organization further noted that exposure to the 5G frequency in the 3.5 gig band, and that's the band that we're using in South Africa, is similar to that from existing mobile phone base stations. And as you know, these have been with us for a number of years so far without issue. So in conclusion, I'd like to state that the acute and long-term effects of RF exposure from the use of mobile phones have been studied extensively 
without showing any conclusive evidence of adverse health effects. As the telecoms regulator, ICASA would like to refute any suggestion that there is a correlation between the COVID-19 epidemic and 5G technologies. There is no evidence that supports the theory that 5G frequencies can cause the COVID-19 virus, or for that matter, any other virus or disease. I thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Pranel. That was very insightful. Uh, for those that are struggling with the bandwidth, I am not saying that 5G is the solution. Moving on to the next speaker, Dr. Musa. Some say laziness is the mother of all inventions. I say necessity is the mother of all inventions. Now, who else is more suited to give us the reason why the move to 5G? Of course, the guys that are leading the invention and the development of 5G technologies. Let us welcome Dr. Musa from Huawei. Uh, Dr. Bello Musa is a head of innovation and ICT strategies at Huawei Solutions Africa, and new technologies aimed at supporting developing countries in unleashing digital opportunities for inclusive development. And this includes solutions related to broadband infrastructure, wireless telecoms protocols, wireless product portfolio management and development. Solution strategy for IoT, 4.5G and 5G, market expansion and operational consultancy for Eastern Europe, Middle East and Africa. Um, Dr. Musa, the floor is all yours. Uh, yes. Um, very good afternoon, Tabo. Thank you very much for this uh, opportunity. Uh, very good evening for the uh, listeners. I am uh, Bello Musa, so I will um, through my presentation, I'll try to uh, give you some insights of why 5G was the industry uptake of 5G, what's the stakes in uh, deploying 5G and probably what are the requirements for, for 5G. As the previous speakers have mentioned, uh, 5G is, uh, is a new generation of wireless mobile technology. Of course, after first, first G, uh, 2G, then uh, 3G, 4G, and then there's come 5G. What makes 5G uh, very different are uh, some of the characteristics. Of course, the peak data rate, the very, uh, high speed and the latency and the number of connection which can be supported by that technology is uh, is tremendous. We are talking about 100 Mbps of data rate. Currently with our mobile uh, technology, we can hardly reach the 5 Mbps or 10 Mbps for the most. So 5G will take us to 100 Mbps on average per user. So you can see the difference. In terms of uh, uh latency we're talking about one millisecond today uh, the 4g technology is around 50 milliseconds so you can see the difference uh the number of connectivity we are talking about millions of devices can be connected in, um, in square kilometers so based on this uh, 5g can have so many applications beyond only the mere connectivities of uh, devices or beyond just providing co uh, communication services like your um, voice uh, services or sending some images or, 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 or streaming some videos. So this is uh, basically some of the differences between the 5G and the 4G. And how do we reach this kind of, uh, of, of, of speed or data rate and number of connectivity, of course, everything, as Professor Allen mentioned, is on the radio uh, spectrum. The radio frequency is the key to that technology. But remember, the radio spectrum is a limited resources. We have to um, cover that or we have to complement that with different type of technology that we call the access technology or air interface technology so for 5g to reach this tremendous amount of speed compared to other previous technology we have made use of so many new modulation technology at its core and also 
some antenna technique like what we call massive MIMO. MIMO stands for multiple input and multiple output. Some coding like the polar encoding, the um, modulation, uh, the flexible uh orthogonal frequency division multiplexing or the scalable uh multiple access uh, technology so all this modulation technology has given the uh radio access the 5g radio access the capability to carry more information in the same amount of spectrum and in the same uh amount of time now for 5g to reach this stage there have been a lot pre-standard uh in fact the the um, studies on the 5G or the IMT 2020, as Dr. Pranil alluded, started in 2016 with what we call the Release 14. So the Release 14 and Release 14, the Release 14 and Release 15 or Phase 1 of 5G had some limited functionality. So we can see the new radio framework was established, the new uh, um, mod uh, modulation and coding scheme and also the frame structure and the MIMO have been established. Now, on the release 15, we come up with the, the, the architecture of the 5G, how the 5G network should be. So here we, we have uh, the new radio and the LTE, which is the fourth uh, generation of uh, technology will coexist and the 5G technology has also embraced a technique that we call the uplink and downlink the coupling and uh, the control plane and the user plane are splitting. Now the phase two of the 5G is what we call release 16, which includes some new access and new uh, application like your extended mobile broadband and the vertical digitalization. So this is another beauty and also characteristic of 5G. When you look at the other technology, the uh, the emphasis was just in a limited scenario, but 5G now comes with the vertical application, with application inside the industry, the different type of industry, thanks to the uh, ultra uh, reliable low latency communication and massive machine type uh, communication and V to X, this is vehicle to X to other communication. So from this standard, this phase, we can see applications such as driverless cars and multitude of different type of, of IoT. And just for the record, this has been one of the fastest standard adoption ever in the radio access technology. Within four years, we have finalized all the standardization and now the 5G is ready to be launched commercially and uh, usability. Now, because of the inherent characteristics of 5G, which is going to be used in different type of industry, of course, the network architecture of 5G will be completely different from other uh, generation of, uh, of, of of network because those generation were only catering for a specific type of services or specific type of users. But with 5G, you will have a network for voice, network for uh, driverless car, network for IoT. How do we solve this problem? Now here comes the concept of network slicing. So you will have the same network foundation, but depending on your services that you are you are going to provide, you would need different type of network requirement. Some of the services like a driverless car, for example, would need a very low latency because if you're in front of on an obstacle, the reaction to your brake has to be sudden. It, 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 it needs no delay, maybe one millisecond. This network for this type of services will be different for a network that will cater for someone sitting at home and enjoying a high definition movies or someone doing a, a video conference in the latency will not be a requirement for him. So with the network slicing concept, we'll be able now to separate the different services, although on the same network, but different services uh, for different type of um, of customer base. And another very important issue is the security. The 5G will be the network that will be deployed everywhere, Internet of Things. Everything will be connected from your air conditioning, your microwave, your geyser to your home, your watches, your glasses, your clothes, everything will be connected. But now how about security? So the 5G um, addresses the 
issue of security from different angles. There have never been any radio access technology which is more secure than 5G. We have it, here are some examples, some cryptographic algorithm. For 5G, we're using 256 bit crypto, uh, cryptographic, whereas for 4G, only 128 bit it used. For 5G, we're going to use the MC encryption, which the encryption could go up to your mobile and SIM or whatever devices will use for identification. And also will use the end-to-end -end protection between uh, between PLMS. And even the air interface will be protected. So 5G uh, provide an extreme, extreme security mechanism that will be very, very hard or difficult to, to even crack it. Another characteristic of 5G, because 5G is built for industry, there are a lot of organizations who are coming up and uh, collaborating with the telecommunications industry, such as the 5GAA. This is the 5G Automotive Association, which brings all the automotive manufacturers and the telecommunication equipment provider and network provider to collaborate together to look into different standards, the user scenario, the testing, and also the business model. Imagine if you have a driveless car, it's a car that drives without a, without a driver, the drive itself is under a certain network, let's say a CLC network or a Vodacom network, for example. What is the business model? Are you going to buy airtime and put it in your car and then when the, the airtime goes down and then you say, oh, I don't have airtime, I have to stop and recharge it again. No, it's not going to be like that. So they have to look into different type of business model. So this, you can see a lot of industry associations which are working together with 5G. So 5G is so important that I'm sure the, the, the audience have heard a lot of hype around 5G. It has even become some kind of international issue. The reason why is because 5G has a big potential into the economy. It is noble what we call the economic growth. The chart that we see here are just some research uh, results from IDC that shows how much value 5G will bring into the economy in terms of employment for different nations. In the United States, for example, we are looking about 719 billion yearly. In Korea, it's 120 billion. In Japan, 492 billion, and so on and so forth. So there is a big stick in 5G. Now, this slide try to quantize the value of 5G by different services. The one, the first one is what we call the enhanced mobile broadband. That is your connectivity, uh, the one that we know now, the traditional one, connecting your, your, your devices, could be your laptop, your TV, and enjoying some services. This will bring around one, more than 400 billion US dollars. The low latency will bring around 430 billion and the massive type of communication will bring around 360 billion. On the left hand side here, we can see how each sectors of the economy will benefit from different type of services. So 5G is huge. And this slide just shows some of the different type of services for different application of 5G. For the extended mobile broadband, you will have your ultra high definition video, AR, VR, augmented reality or virtual reality, cloud gaming, uh, home broadband, in venue wireless and in car operations. For the ultra reliable low latency, you can see industrial automation, remote factory, remote surgery, uh, self-driving vehicle, uh, ultra reliable application. And for your uh, um, what we call massive uh, machine type communication, we're looking into smart home where in your house everything will be connected. You have energy, electricity, uh, smart agriculture, uh, logistic, and of course, smart city. So the following slide are just some of the application of 5G in China during the COVID-19. We know China was one of the first countries to be hit with that, and they, they they make use of their of their 5G to innovate, like the 5G unnamed vehicle. These vehicles are loaded with medicine, with some um, 
uh, uh, some uh, sanitizers or gloves, and they are directed into in, 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 into into places without any driver, and they are distributing all these things to, to to people. You have a medical robot, for example. These are robots in hospitals which are loaded with medication, and they can go in each yard, in each room, and give uh, medication to people. Of course, this technology is not only 5G, but the core of it is 5G. And of course, with artificial intelligence and other type of, uh, of a technology. The second use case of 5G that I would like to bring into, into in a, a here is the what we call the 5G fixed wireless access. We believe this will be one of the most important usage of 5G, and especially here in Africa, where access to broadband is limited by connectivity, by access, by availability of fibers. So 5G fixed wireless access can change this scenario and will help a lot by providing uh, all this connectivity at home. And by the way, all the first 5G deployment in Africa that we have seen so far are all providing this fixed uh, wireless access. And of course, for the high definition or uh, extended mobile broadband, we are experimenting something that we call a virtual safari something that through the 5G network, we will be able to provide high definition images, interactive images to viewers all around the world. These are also one of the application of 5G. And the application of uh, ultra reliable or machine type communication here is the combination of 5G and artificial intelligence in the operation of our seaport. So we have uh, cases around the world where the port is completely automated. Um, they have 5G and artificial intelligence and everything is controlled and everything is, uh, is, 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 is running through the 5G. And of course, before we reach to this level of application of 5G, there are certain requirements. As uh, Professor Pranel and Professor Allen have mentioned it, we need spectrum. Spectrum is the key requirement. How much spectrum we're gonna need is between at least 80 megahertz to 100 megahertz per operators. Of course, in some countries, this is challenging. We can have this 80 or 100 megahertz free of spectrum. That's how other technology, as Professor Pranel mentioned, carrier aggregation or multiple um, access technology, MIMO, are coming into play. We need a strong regulatory arrangement, regulatory, regulatory uh, 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 body. Today, the regulation that we have in the telecommunication I will say they are all school. We are having new services which are coming. For instance, a driverless car. If one day we have a driverless car in, 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 in Africa, how are we going to regulate that? Who's going to pay for insurance? Who, who? What kind of business model? All these kind of things, we have to start thinking about it before we even start thinking of deploying uh, 5G. 5G will provide a huge coverage. Coverage will be everywhere. We need some policy that will uh, facilitate the approval of site, some obligation, some uh, subsidies also, why not? So all these, all of these are the requirements for, for 5G. And of course, innovation. 5G is not about speed, it's not about the number of connectivity, it's not about the latency. Those are inherent to 5G. Those are the characteristic of 5G. Now is how are we going to use 5G? So this is where the innovation comes into play. We, the application of 5G in China will not be the same in Africa. It's not going to be the same in Europe. There won't be any copy and paste in the 5G era. We have to think out of the box to come up with new services. Um, in Korea, for example, uh, the, um, the, the South Korean uh, KT, the Korean telecoms, they said they will build their own 5G network in layers and most of it will go into the car manufacturing businesses because that's one of their strength, manufacturing cars. So we have to think about the innovation. What are we going to do? What kind of services we're going to do with, uh, with the 5G? So this brings me uh, to the end of my presentation. But if I have one or two seconds, I would like to uh, show you some few slides about the um the meat 
that is surrounding the 5G that today 5G is causing COVID, 5G is a problem. I don't know, Tabo, if I can carry on or uh, I'll ask my turn. You've reached your time, but I'll allow it, Prof. Uh, Doctor, just, just real quick. All right, thank you very much. So um, along the history, many great invention in history were initially misunderstood by some type of people. So here we've got some tree, like when the steam engine came, there were people who, because of the noise, they think it was a uh, monster. Even uh, during the invention of the aircraft, people were asking questions, how safe and this, how useful this will be. Even the first vaccine have caused problems. Certain people have seen something wrong about it. All right, so this is the case with 5G. I don't know if it's a coincidence or what is it, but this time around 5G and the COVID have been have been uh, in, in, in conflict. But when we look around the history, the COVID, the coronaviruses themselves, they were here, they were present for, for, for decades, for, for, I don't know, for centuries. The first coronavirus were found, they say, in 1937 in the USA. Then in 1965, you have the different, different type of coronaviruses. Even just in 2012, there was this merge called it was a type of coronavirus. And in 2019, then come the COVID-19. So I don't know how people make all this correlation between these viruses with, with 5G. So these here are some of the myths. They say 5G is appear with 5G. So today in the, in the world, we only have less than 30 countries which have deployed 5G, whereas the coronavirus today is almost everywhere around the world. Even here in Africa, we have countries who they don't even, they haven't deployed 4G, but unfortunately they have uh, the coronavirus. In terms of frequency band, Professor Allen mentioned the same frequency band today that we use for 5G is the same frequency that we've been using for Wi-Fi and also some of them for 4G and 5G. So why is that the same frequency that causes, that, that we use for, five, for, for Wi-Fi doesn't cause uh, a, a, a virus? And these are uh, this page I would just give it because Professor Allen and Dr. Panda have mentioned it. And here is uh, Professor Allen mentioned it here, and Pro, uh, Dr. Pranel mentioned every equipment, telecom equipment entering a country, especially South Africa, has to go through testing. And the international uh, body are fixing a type of a limit amount of power that is required for each and every equipment. For 5G base station running on C band, the Africa and the uh, European Union are using, are accepting 10 watt per square meter. This is the, the power required or authorized in, in Africa and in Europe. I don't know why we don't do our own testing, but I'm sure even if we do, we cannot exceed that level. This amount of power is much higher than your light bulb, which is giving around 20 to 200 watt in your bedroom or in your in your in your living room your automobile light 50 to 80 watt and if we take this amount and we, we divide it this is by square meter you divide it per person it's around 0 0.1 to 0 0.5 milliwatt per person per square meter which is smaller than your phone or your hairdryer, which is four milli milliwatt per square meter or even your micro oven in your in your kitchen which is more than 100 times bigger. So there is no way that 5G radiation will cause any health hazard, live alone uh, COVID-19. So Tabo, uh, this is the end of my presentation. Thank you so much for the extra time. That it, it, it's fine, I'll take it from your, your Q&A session. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. It's it's good that the conversation is flowing on the chat, but please remember to mark your, if it's a question, mark it with a cue to ensure that I can um, see that it's a question. Continue chatting on the platform. I'm going to allow uh, the, the panelists that have completed the, the, the presentation to try and answer some of the questions that are on the chat because we're slowly running out of time. Um, we're going to move to our last speaker. I think we've heard enough from the engineers. Now we need to hear from a different thought. Um, of course, the engineers have proven that they're not all about the zeros and the ones. Now to switch things around, we'll be hearing from uh, a biological or epidemi 
epidemiological, it's still a word that I'm struggling to find, side of things. It looks like there's a trend every time there's a move to a new G. Our next speaker, Pule Tahane, will unpack it for us. Uh, Mr. Pule okay. Tahane has a strong background in plant molecular biology. While still pursuing his studies at the University of Cape Town, he was introduced to entrepreneurship. He later founded a series of businesses, one of which is an aqua company, aquaculture company. This led him into taking up studies in aquaculture production management at the University of Stellenbosch. Mr. Tahane has also worked as a consultant for the Honey Guide Group, a company focusing on investing and collaborating with SSMEs from emerging market. He's currently based at the University of Pretoria. Pule, floor is yours. Let's try and keep Thank it short. You. Thank you, Tabon. Good evening, everybody. Tonight, we'll be looking at the myths around 5G technology and COVID-19. So where do all these myths originate? Well, there's been a myth behind most technological development based on a coincidence. For example, GMOs, or genetically modified organisms, and cancer, vaccines, and autism, and in the telecoms field, 5G and COVID-19, 4G and H1N1, and all the way to the introduction of radio waves in the Spanish flu of 1918. At their core, myths have a kernel of truth. However, in order to debunk them, we need to find the facts and se separate them from the fiction. I shall use a case study on rats to illustrate this. There are two classes of disease that technology could cause, non-communicable and communicable disease. Communicable diseases are those that can be trans transmitted from one person to another. For example, HIV transmitted via exchange of bodily fluids and malaria via an insect vector, the mosquito. Non-communicable diseases are those that cannot be passed on to another person, for example, cancer, diabetes, and asthma. In order to understand these diseases, you need to perform different types of studies, biological and epidemiological. Biological looks at the link between a suspected disease and the presentation of a disease in individuals. Epidemiological looks at the distribution and frequency of a disease in a population and the possible control measures. So what is COVID-19? COVID-19 is actually our second interaction with a severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus. The first human interaction with a coronavirus was in 2002, way before 5G technology. Biologically, the causative agent is an RNA-based virus with crown-like spikes that cause a variety of respiratory symptoms. Epidemiologically, highly contagious and is currently distributed globally, therefore deemed communicable. To date, there is no link between 5G or any other telecoms technology and any transmissible disease. We need to then ask ourselves, is there a link to non-communicable disease? As the previous speakers have mentioned, telecoms technology is based on non-ionizing EM radiation, and there are two authoritative, authoritative bodies that produce exposure guidelines, the International Commission on Non-Ionizing Radiation Protection and the Institute of Electrical and Electron Electronics Engineers. These two bodies need experimental data with measurable parameters in order to set exposure guidelines. <clears throat> well, definition of measurable parameters are based on the cancer evaluation criteria. This is where a potential carcinogen is studied and the strength of its causative effect is determined. There are five outcome, outcomes categories, two negative indicating no or limited evidence of carcinogenic activity, two positive indicating clear or some uh, link with carcinogenic activity and one for uncertain findings. So speaking about case studies, the first case study I'd like to present was one performed on chicken embryos where the investigators were looking at the potential of tissue and DNA damage. So 
chicken M, uh, chicken eggs were exposed to 2G and 5G radiation for 75 minutes in a 12 hour period. And the conclusion was that there was some evidence of limit da liver damage, but as the investigators also agreed, there's a limited ability to extrapolate findings to human beings. As I mentioned before, there's this rat case study that was used to develop a myth. In this uh, study, the investigators looked at the toxicity of radio frequency on rats. The rats were housed in cages unrestrained and were exposed to uh, radiation, uniform radiation, for 10 minutes. Uh, for 10 minutes over a period of nine hours in a 24 hour period. So what they saw was that there was a clear evidence of tumors on the heart and some evidence of tumors on the brain. However, the issue with the study is that the rats, the uniform exposure of the rats was over their entire body. And this cannot be extrapolated to human beings as your phone is in your pocket or bag or in your hand next to your head, and not, you're not exposed to electronic um, EM radiation throughout your entire body. But unfortunately, newspapers and some members of the general public picked up on the brain tumors and then used this as their foundation to, to believe that um, EM technology leads to brain cancers or cancers in general. There was another case study performed on human beings, and this was conducted on university students. The aim was to evaluate 3G and LTE on neural pathways or on cognitive performance. So they measured brain activity via probes attached to the scalp, and a cognitive test was performed, the Stroop test. This test uses colors and words and the ability to identify the color or the word. For example, they would write the, the word red in red or the word red in blue, and then asking the question of, is it red, the word, or red, the color? And the time taken for between asking the question and the response was used to determine if the LTE or 3G technology was impacting on cognitive abilities. It must be noted that no students were harmed during the experiment, and the conclusion that, was in, that came out was that there's a notable decrease in alpha brain waves. But the investigators did say that a change to a cell phone design will limit this. Ultimately, in conclusion, there has been no link between the effects of mobile telecoms technology and the and a side effect on human beings but the greatest problem that was seen was banned from cell phones overheating and this is a function of cell phone design so as we move along in terms of technological de development we must always be sure that no new myths are created however we're starting a new we're starting to see a new myth being born when we are starting to talk about what 6g should be and the link that people are already creating a link between Spike D614G, which is deemed to be the COVID 19 2.0. Spike is COVID 19 with 14 amino acid, um, with amino acid changes on its spikes, and, they, and it is reported that, or let me not say reported, it is said that by the Washington Post, Sky News, Fox, and the Thailand Medical News that this new type of coronavirus will be immune from any vaccine that we, we, we will be creating in the future. So ultimately, scientists should always be proactive in their investigations and also explain their findings in a manner that the layperson understands without increasing confusion or making a new myth, same as with the new talk of Spike. And thank you for your time. And back to you, Tabo. Thanks, Tabo. All right. Thanks a lot, Bude. Uh, that was pretty interesting, aside from the glitches that we had. 
we've slowly run out of time. We won't have enough time to go through all the questions that have, put, uh, have been put through on the chat, but I'll, I'll allow uh, maybe for about five minutes while the panelists try and answer one or two of the questions that you guys have put up on the, on the chat. Uh, if we don't pick your question, please uh, don't be mad. Uh, we'll try and consolidate all the questions and send them out later. Uh, there was one from uh, Tadala Malua. Um, uh, this is to Dr. Pranel. Ikasa is disputing the concern that the public has. However, there is, where there's smoke, uh, there's fire, surely. Can we get to the bottom of this with facts? This is a pretty much uh, simple answer, but I'll allow Dr. Pranel to indulge you. Dr. Pranel? Well, thanks, Chabo. Uh well, ICASA is not aware of, of any any real fire uh, with regards to 5G and COVID-19. Yeah, in our experience and in all the research that we have done, uh, there is simply no evidence that points to that 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 link. So um, I don't know how this has started and and what who's caused that. Uh, but there's definitely with that specific uh, issue with COVID-19, we, we really don't know what, what the answer to that is and how did, did that come about. In terms of the overall health risks of uh, uh, radio frequency waves and um, the, the way that it impacts the body, uh, that has been an ongoing debate. And 5G um, basically exacerbates that, that uh, um concern amongst the community. Um, and we can only trust uh, in medical professionals to guide us in, in that respect. Uh, I hope I've answered the question, thanks. All right, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Pranel. Um, there's a question to Dr. Musa. I, I think this would be the last question and then we can close off on this. And then all the other questions, we'll collate them and then try to respond them uh, at a later stage. Yes, yes, go ahead. So before you finish, there was a question that was asked um, that you sent um, yesterday uh, about if it affects plants. And no, it does not affect plants at all. All right, thanks a lot to that. So the question was, does 5G actually affect the growth of plants? So you had the answer from uh, Pule. Uh, there's another one to Dr. Musa. It's from uh, Vessel van Brekel. Uh, question is, how do you as Huawei ensure that exposure inside each of your beams do not exceed the international guidelines, as per currently the topic of the standard development of IEC 622.32? Thus, what counters and limiting has been implemented? What are the periods used? Well, uh, what I know is, um Huawei adheres strictly to the uh, international uh, standard and regulation in terms of uh, emitted power. Uh, and before um, any equipment is allowed to any given country, it also has to go through the testing just to make sure that uh, those equipment are uh, responding to, to those requirements. Uh, and for uh, how we do that, I think uh, the answer will be more technical. I can follow that uh, offline if I can have his uh, email address. We'll definitely make that available. Sure. All right. All right, everybody. I'd like to thank all the participants that have stayed with us till this long. We know it's a, it's a, it's a bit late and people must go and cook. But thank you very much. Uh, keep your eyes uh, clued to your screens, your cell phone screens. We will be posting the, this session on the South African Institute of Electrical Engineers uh, YouTube page and also on the uh, social media as well. Thank you, everyone. Uh, please keep safe and adhere to the lockdown rules. Thank you, everybody. Goodbye.